My job is about cueing emotion, oftentimes uh, without you noticing. In fact, if I'm doing my job really well, sometimes you don't even hear it. I mean, think of a horror film. Music informs us that there's something evil lurking around the corner, but we'll never tell you when that evil is going to jump out and scare the living daylights out of you. I mean, that's my job, is to help tell stories, help these directors tell stories, to help make moments that, uh, big moments become thrilling moments, to help tender moments become tearful. And it's done through this medium of music, which is not just heard, it's felt. So it actually is somewhat subconscious as well. And it's on one hand incredibly challenging, but on the other hand very gratifying because you kind of do get to be a little bit of a puppet master behind the scenes. Uh, think of uh, Superman uh, or any superhero movie. Well, when the superhero comes on the screen, it's all major chords and it's big and it's happy and it's positive. And then when the villain comes on the screen, it's, we play minor chords and they're very crunching and dissonant. And it literally is, one of them is positive, and one of them isn't as positive. So we do this also with characters. Uh, when I was asked to score the film Juno, one of the clips you saw there, uh, the, the script, when I, I was introduced to the script by the director Jason Reitman, I was blown away by how organic and real these characters were. And I just wanted to honor that. And then when uh, he introduced me to Kim Yudas and Moldy Peaches, and I was like, wow, this is a great sound. And I thought, how do I make this music feel organic and real, just as real as, as these characters? And so one idea I had was I was like, OK, instead of a drum set, which you know that has like a kick drum, a snare drum, and hi-hats, and I had, uh, I would just take a pint glass of water and pour it into a bucket, and it would go boom, and that was my kick drum. And then it was really hot in my studio that summer, so I took, um, and I had a fan in my studio, and it had a metal grate on it. So I took some wire brushes, and I played the grate of the fan, and that was my hi-hat. So there's all these things informing uh, the viewer, but they weren't really paying attention to them, but that, they just heard drums. Uh, but it was something very organic feeling. Same with the guitar. Uh, I remember working with one of my guitars one night, he brought over a few guitars, we were gonna try them out, and he had a couple fancy guitars, and he had this one that was, that was uh, called a Stella, it was like a Sears practice guitar. He goes, oh, I got this at a garage sale for $25, I bought it for the case. And I heard him and he, and he was trying to get it in tune and he could not get the thing in tune. And I'm sitting there working away and I'm just hearing him in the background. And then and he finally, he strummed it one time and I was like, that's her. I go, that's Juno. Because she was rough around the edges. She's full of character. This guitar was full of character. It really, <laughs> we couldn't get it perfectly in tune and that's, what served the picture. So what I want to do is show you that clip that you just saw, but I want you to see it through a different lens now. I want you to see it through the, some of the subconscious work we're doing when you're watching a film, which is, the, the, to set it up, the, uh, the characters that she's going to see are the Lorings, and they're very uptight, and well, not super uptight, but they're very straight-laced, they shop at Pottery Barn. Uh, so, so everything I did in their music, I, I wrote kind of a bossa nova, but everything was perfectly on the beat, very tight. And then Juno, who is very loose, is this guitar that doesn't quite get in tune. And so what happens is you'll hear this, this bossa nova start playing, and then you'll see this awesome blue minivan come into the picture, and you're going to hear this kind of looser guitar. So uh, would you go ahead and roll that, this next clip? I miss home. I imagine some of you might miss home on occasion. Uh, so what I would do is I would play piano, because it reminded me of home. In the university I went to had all these beautiful grand pianos around. So I would play them so often that people would start asking me, hey, do you have an album? And, and I didn't at the time, but I had a friend who was taking an, an engineering class, and uh, we found a way to sneak into my university studio between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. <laughs> I paid the engineers with beer and pizza, and we would make a record. I'd make a solo piano record. 
And then I would go to the art department and I'd say, hi, my name is Matteo Messina. I just made this album called Trade Winds. Does anybody want to design a cover? And half a dozen people would raise their hand. And then we picked the best one and then uh, we eventually packaged it. And then next time I'd be playing piano, somebody would say, hey, do you have an album? I was like, why, yes, I do. <laughs> and, uh, and I did this for about three albums. And on the third one, one of the engineers says, hey, have you ever used MIDI? I was like, no, what's that? He said, it's how instruments communicate with computers. It's like, okay. He said, we'll come to this other studio tomorrow. So I went to this other studio and he had a keyboard. He said, okay, play one of your piano songs. So I played the piano song in and I looked up on the screen and there was all the notation. And I was like, wait a second, I don't read music. And there was my great communicator. And I was like, that's pretty cool. And then, then he had to do something else. He goes, well, now I'm gonna play your piano song back. Here's a, uh, here's a sound of a flute. Maybe you'll play that with it. So then I'm playing the flute along with the piano I heard. And then he goes, here's some strings. And I was playing the strings along with the piano and the flute. And I said, I don't wanna sound crazy, but I've always heard all this in my head. I was like, I'm gonna write a symphony someday. Never knew how impactful that statement would be in my life. I never studied classical music, honestly didn't listen to much classical music. Um, but fast forward to about a year later, I graduated, I was down in Seattle, Washington, back in my hometown, and they just happened to be building a brand new city block long and wide symphony hall. And I, was, I studied business, not music, and, uh, and so I was on the, one of my jobs, my first jobs in my career working for a network security company, and anytime I passed that, that structure while it's being constructed, I would go, oh, I'm gonna play there someday. Still have no idea why. And then lastly, I really know what compelled me to do this, but one day, I think it was around 23, I walked into the uh, Seattle Symphony's offices across the street from the construction site, and I said, hi, my name is Matteo Messina. I'm putting together an orchestra. I'd love to debut my first symphony here. And the guy goes, what are your credits? And by this time, I had a few piano albums <laughs> that we recorded with lots of beer and pizza, basically. <laughs> he said, okay, how, if you can do this, this, and this, insurance deposit, all these things, he goes, I'll put you in our recital hall. And, and uh, I think that was his litmus test. I don't think he, you know, he didn't expect me to return, but of course, three days later, I showed up with everything I needed. And, and I remember this really well because he goes, okay, we discussed the co-production. At the very end of it, he said, uh, we look, let's see what he said, he goes, you're going to be, we open in the end of October, you're going to be our ninth and 10th concert, you're going to be two Saturday nights apart on December 5th and 11th, we look forward to seeing you in seven months. And I remember walking out on the second avenue going, oh, I gotta figure out how to write a symphony. <laughs> So I, uh, I hopped my mountain bike, I bought a professional keyboard, borrowed a computer for a while until I got my own computer, and then I went to get this MIDI software, which was prohibitively expensive at the time, and so I looked up and found a company called MIDI Soft, and, and, uh, and I called them up and I said, hi, my name is Matteo Messina, I can't read music, but I think I can write a symphony using your software, and I'm booking, booked into the new symphony hall when it opens this fall. If I put presented by you guys on my tickets, would you give me your software? And they're like, absolutely. And I was like, okay, we're off and running. So I then uh, started writing this out. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write it about human emotion. And, and uh, so I decided I'm writing a symphony called Human. I did all the piano sketches. And then I was like, okay, now I'm going to map the instruments, the instruments of the orchestra onto what I sketched. And then it dawned on me, I was like, I don't even know what the instruments of the orchestra are. <laughs> <laughs> So I went to the university bookstore in, in my city and I found a book on the orchestra for kids, which is awesome because it has pictures. <laughs> so I open it up and it shows like the French horn and below it, it would show uh, a piano and it would shade in the range of where the French horn played. So I took a piece of tape across the bottom of that keyboard and I took a sharpie and I wrote French horn low, French horn high. And I was like, play it between here. And then I did that for all the instruments. I was like cello, cello, viola, viola, violin, violin. And I ended up writing my first symphony by ear, making tons and tons of mistakes as I went along, but learning from each of those mistakes, especially when I had real players play it, and I was like, oh, that sounds okay on a computer, not in real life sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and then I went to put this, I uh, put an orchestra together, we were quite a ragtag bunch, one night we got locked out of the, the church we were rehearsing in, so we rehearsed at the trumpet player's frat house, I mean, we, we made it happen now. And then I went to do this first concert, and, and I, I remember thinking, you know, I don't want to just say, here's my art, appreciate it or don't. You know, I thought, you know, we want to know more about music. Like, have you guys ever opened up a CD and, uh, and then you read the lyrics, but then you catch yourself reading who they thanked? You know, like that, that's because we want to know more about music. So my idea was, I wrote this symphony about, it was about the human condition, human emotions, love, joy, pain, sorrow, fear, and I wanted to introduce each piece. So the best example of this is first love. I remember walking up to the edge of the stage and asking, do you remember your first love? 
And a few people kind of chuckled. And then I go, what was their name? And it was the funniest thing because the whole audience went, oh. And then they erupted in laughter because they're all laughing, you know, laughing at them, groaning like, oh, her, oh, him. <laughs> but what was weird is I go, do you remember that first time you fell in love and how electric it was and how, how excited you were and how you probably mentioned their name in conversation without even noticing. You laughed more. You, you didn't know there was a harsh side. You couldn't believe someone loved you. I'd say that's what this next piece is about. And then I would sit down at the piano, start my orchestra, and we'd play this piece for about seven minutes that I wrote that was very personal with my first love, but it didn't matter because everyone in that audience was thinking, whether they're with their boyfriend or girlfriend, their husband or wife, or on their own, thinking of their first love for those seven minutes. We did this for nine emotions. I think I exhausted my audience by the end of the concert. They all went on their personal life journey. But at the end, uh, that was on a Saturday night. By Monday, we sold out for my next Saturday night's concert, and that was the start of my career as a symphony composer. So, what happened a few days after that first concert really changed my life. It was an incredible blessing. And that was, I was talking to a, a colleague of mine, and I, and I didn't know this about him, but he said, you know what, I, I don't know if you know this, but my daughter recently passed of a brain tumor, and you know, she was at Seattle Children's Hospital. They made the last year of her life quite incredible, because it really is an incredible place. And he goes, they have a piano there. And he knew I played piano all over, so of course, instantly, I, I called him up and said, hey, uh, can I come down and play piano? And they said yes, and so I went down there, and what happened was, even though it's, it starts out so simple, but I, I, I'm still there 13 years later, and we write songs about bees and dogs and farts, and we forget about cancer for an hour or 10 minutes or however long it is that we're together. And then I started meeting these families. And these families, uh, I, I learned that, you know, it, it, it's incredibly like financially impactful to a family to, to go through a disease like this. And so I thought, you know what, I'm gonna take what I do, do in these concerts and I'm gonna make them raise money for these families. And then I thought, well, as I do this, I want to be a pioneer in what I'm doing. So I make my concerts. They're, they're not typical symphonies. I take the, the notion of symphony and turn it on its ear every chance I get. So like one day I'll march, like one concert I march the entire University of Washington drumline down one aisle and a big 50-person Brazilian drumline down the other and had them battle it out on stage. And one time I brought a, a, a barista from Starbucks on stage and I mic'd all the different parts of the stand and the grinder, the blender, and, and everything. And we made a cup of coffee on stage with the orchestra matching all the, all the movements and all the sounds, and then we served a cup of coffee to the audience. Um, and so I want to show you a clip of what started as a fundraiser, maybe $2,000 at first, or 1000 somewhere in there, and now these have turned into something where we raised, last year we raised over 200000 and this year I want to raise a quarter million. So I'm just going to show you a clip where, actually I invite also special guests. One year I invited a DJ to come, a chemist, and this is a, a band, Alice in Chains, performing a, a piece that I really love. So I'm gonna play this one for you. By the way, this is the second time I've ever conducted in my life. fire somewhere like six minutes into that epic song just went <laughs> so what happened from there was somebody from the NFL was in the audience and they said will you come do this for our uh, season opener 
So the next thing I know, I'd only conducted this, this is my second time, I ended up finding myself in front of 72,000 people <laughs> doing the same thing and having a lot of fun at it, by the way. I had been asked to do these types of performances and, and set up these shows uh, uh, all over, and it's, it's thrilling. So if I can leave you with one thing, I want you to think of back to when I said I had an idea, because that's what it was. When I was 22, I was like, hey, I have an idea. I want to write a symphony someday. But no one gave me any permission. No one said, I think you're, you'd probably be a great composer. I just tried it, and I was relentless in my pursuit. And, and that's what I want you to think about, is what do you want to try? What do you have to lose? And I want to leave you with one anecdote that I, I was talking to my father years ago, telling him one of my capricious ideas. I was like, Dad, I'm going to hide the entire orchestra behind a screen, and then I'm going to have lights come out, so all you see are their bows and the tops of their heads, and then I'm going to have a giant light underneath the conductor, so he's 30 feet tall, and then while he's conducting, there's going to be dancers come out the side of him like Shiva, and they come around the stage. <laughs> and you thought that I actually did this, but... <laughs> But, but what was fun was uh, my dad, uh, he laughed a bit, and then he goes, he goes, you know, you still don't know what you can't do. And at first I was like, hey, I took offense. I was like, I'm an adult. I know what I can and can't do. But then I realized that was the greatest compliment I have ever received in my life from a man who I have deep, deep respect for. And so I don't want you to know what you can't do. I want you to think of what is your idea. I want you to think of how you want to pursue that idea. Forget the rules. I want to you know, think where you can be a decade later. Because I can honestly tell you, I now have a career that is incredibly inspiring. I, I have a blast doing it. I have a, uh, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. Uh, and and I, I also uh, get to live a life of volunteering, which fills one's heart, I can tell you. When you give, you really get. And I wake up most days smiling. And so, I guess what I'm not saying is, you know, when he's, I, I don't want you to know what you can't do. I'm not saying live your life, you know, throw yourself into this world with reckless abandon. But what I do want to say is throw yourself into this world with reckless abandon. <laughs> Thank you.